Okay, welcome back to the Order of Chaos podcast. Uh, you know, when I started this show, my intent was to speak to people, um, not just in the occult world, but in all areas of the paranormal and the strange and unusual and conspiracy theories and kind of all this stuff mashed up together, right? Like, my hero as a child was actually Fox Mulder. Uh, and it was a little unusual, but like... That's just what I'm into, right? So today, my guest is Mark Sargent. You may know Mark from the Netflix documentary, Behind the Curve. He is a member of the Flat Earth Society. And um, today, we're going to hear about his perspectives on a lot of uh, other existing conspiracy theories and, and ideas that are outside of the realm of normal. So, Mark, welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you for having me. And right off the bat, I heartily endorse this product and or event. Right on. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, to, and by the way, I, I must make a quick correction. I, yeah, technically speaking, and I'll, I'll even hold up the card. I am a member of the Flat Earth Society. I joined it back. I, I applied back in 2014. There's my card right there. Uh, however, no one else in the Flat Earth, if Flat Earth was software, we would be Flat Earth 2.0. Meaning the, the old Flat Earth societies have nothing to do with us whatsoever. I applied to this just because I didn't know what the hell I was doing back in 2014. And I quickly understood that they were doing nothing. Absolutely nothing. It was weird. It was like this little club of 500 people with a velvet rope and the trolls were running the velvet rope. And all these trolls, I mean, the trolls were literally running the forums saying there's nothing to see here. Go away. Nothing to see here. Go away. And I put that in my clues. I said, look. Don't even bother going to the Flyer Society because they have nothing to do with us. In fact, even when we were running rampant throughout the internet, they didn't even get a hold of us until, oh God, almost two years in, two years. And then somebody called me and they said, oh yeah, I really support what you do, blah. I go, I go where the hell have you guys been? <laughs> I go, we've been, we didn't, we don't need you. So we don't need your support. Go away. And that was the last we ever heard of him. Wow, that's very interesting. I didn't know that. Um, yeah. So anyway, I'm just saying that if you ever talk to anybody else when you say flatter society, first thing out of the gate, everyone will be like, yeah, we're, we're not them. I mean, yes, I am a card-carrying member. That's as far as it goes. So since the Netflix documentary came out, can you give us like, so let's, because that's kind of how I discovered you, right? I just right. saw the documentary myself for the first time last week, and I thought this is really interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't personally myself believe that the earth is flat. But I'm watching this documentary and I'm seeing this group of people that I have so much in common with because I, I believe in astrology. I believe in numerology. I'm a professional tarot card reader. I talk to spirits. I mean, I have a lot of beliefs that, that you know, normal people may look at and say that's wacky. But at the same time, millions of people believe in astrology. And there are millions of people in the world, billions of people who are devoutly religious, who have beliefs that Neil deGrasse Tyson might smirk at. You know, so why why is it flat earth that people say like, well, that's just stupid and ridiculous, but with all these other things, they're so open, right? And so that bothered me when I watched the documentary. I thought they're not treating these people very well. They're making fun of them, um, you know, because it's easy to or because it because they feel like it's low hanging fruit, and it, that really bothered me. So that's why I reached out to you and why I wanted yeah. to do this show, and also because, like I said, you're an interesting guy and. Uh, you know, as I said in my introduction, I, Fox Mulder was my hero as a kid. And if Fox was a real dude, he would he would love to talk to you. Yeah, he would. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm, I'm sad that there isn't a guy like Fox. Mulder. I mean, a guy like Fox Mulder would never be in the FBI. They, they would have. And I know the show was kind of centered around how he was the black sheep of, of the FBI. But I mean, come on, he would have been drummed out so quickly. Yeah, because yeah. He, he just didn't toe the line. I mean, he broke so many protocols all the time. Yeah. But but yeah no I lo I love the X Files I think I I enjoyed I rewatched uh, um, the that first X Files movie you know where they blew up the building yeah and it's like yeah right on 
Uh, X Files is among the shows that you know during this last year that we've all been stuck inside that I binge watched from episode one all the way through. Really? And, uh, oh yeah, I loved it. Wow. I've I've, wa- I've been watched a, a lot a lot of shows. Did you watch any of the new ones? I I don't watch the new ones. Um, I haven't watched them. I'm one of those people like I don't want to see a reboot. I don't want to see a remake. I don't want people to ruin my childhood any more than they yeah. already have. So I tend to stay away from that stuff. Yeah. So one of the things that occurred to me first, right off the bat, when watching the Netflix documentary, is there's that scene with Neil deGrasse Tyson where he gets heated and says the Earth isn't fucking flat, and then drops the mic and says, "And this On is Comedy gravity, Central, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah." And then so immediately after that, after I watched the documentary, it occurred to me that I've also seen Neil deGrasse Tyson. Sorry, yeah. um, when he is confronted with Elon Musk saying that the likelihood that we live in a simulation is almost 100%. Yeah. That, and then Neil deGrasse Tyson says, I have a hard time arguing with this. Yeah. So, okay, so if this is a, a simulation or a hologram or, or some kind of, if reality is not real, then if this is a simulation, then all bets are off. Right. And that's, that's my opinion. And I, I agree. I think that, you know, from my perspective, coming from a more spiritual standpoint, you know, this is this is not what it seems. And that's that's where I feel like we can all sort of agree, like everybody who's in the conspiracy or, you know, alternative belief field is can can say we're all looking for what's really going on here. Right. What's really going on here? Because so much of reality to me seems like a setup, like it's almost a joke and you're supposed to get the joke. <laughs> um, so much of this is is so unlikely for example yeah. the moon you know we have no idea how the moon got to be where it is it doesn't it doesn't really work out they have all these theories and models and some of them kind of work out but we all know the moon is way bigger than it should be if it were way a natural bigger. side of the light it, of the earth it, and the fact that it is exactly the right size to cover the sun is yeah. in, a, in an eclipse is nothing short of miraculous oh yeah it is 400 times less or 400 times more narrow and 400 times closer than the mm-hmm. sun yeah. Exactly. And so they Delicious. line up perfectly and oh, yeah, create well, this event should never happen naturally. Oh, hell, dude. You're going to go down that road. No, the moon makes no sense. Absolutely yeah. no sense. Um, it also is um, perfectly lined up. So we only see exactly the same face of the moon. It doesn't move a quarter of a degree in 50 years. You know, it never, we always only see the same face. Or, or how about the little things? Like, why are all the craters circular? Meaning they would have had to come in at right angles, you know, and straight in. You you should see these big divots. Why, in fact, why does the moon have so many more craters than the Earth does? And the, the moon has these massive, massive craters. It's like, wouldn't the Earth have deflected some of these into the Earth or put them? You know, it's like, why why does the moon look like it was used as a shooting gallery at some point? It's just absolutely bizarre to me. No, no, no. The, the moon. Or, Honestly, I could spend I could spend a lot of time well, if we get into the moon missions. Once you even and that's just the, the what we're talking about is just the observational from a distance. When you get close up, supposedly the whole all the stuff with the Apollo that makes even less sense. So no. yeah, that's the next thing I was going to bring up that we have in common is again though I I'm a round earther. It, it, that's what seems intuitively correct to me. However, I am highly suspicious of NASA. Yeah, uh, I th- I think when you and I remember thinking this when I was just a little kid. You watch those moon landing videos and it's like, this is fake. This is totally fucking fake. This is yeah. very bad special effects by today's standards. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I can't get we, behind and, it. You know, I'm, I'm not going to say we've never been to the moon, but I will say the footage that you see, the official moon landing story, I think that's garbage nonsense. I yeah, think that's yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, what's interesting to me is that the your, your brains, your nerds, your geeks, whatever you want to call it, they were picking on the moon missions immediately, right after it was done. You know, the, the shot I just sent you uh, in chat, for example, is a great, great shot from 1969. And, but you had nowhere to go. I mean, the internet was a long ways off. And so who did you talk to about, you know, this? And most of the time you had to go to like a UFO convention to share your info. And that's pretty, you know, sketchy to start with. That shot, by the way, is uh, just a random shot from Apollo 12. In 1969, remember they did six missions. Boom, 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 boom. Really, really quick, flawlessly. Nothing, nothing bad ever happened. The longer you stare at that shot, and it's time and date stamped. That's straight from NASA. The worse it gets, because there's a lot of stuff in that picture that don't make sense. And 
I even give people, I say, look, if you want to, you know, I'll even give you the no stars. If Because I a lot of people say, well, there's no stars in the background. I go, yeah, I know there's no stars anywhere. And they, so it's an exposure setting. That's why there was no stars. I go, that's not why there's no stars, but fine, you can have it. There's no stars because in 1969, mathematically, it would be a torture chamber trying to get all the stars in the right place at the right time. Because remember, the stars from the moon are still the stars. So the belt of Orion, if it is in the wrong place in the sky when this shot is taken, Oh, you, you got a whole bunch of people that are going to be like, well, the time and date stamps off. And then if it's off all the time or you see replicates anyway, um, little things that that shot, by the way, I don't know if you want to include it in your thing or if we're just talking about it. And I'm not staring at it. I, I've memorized this shot um, real quick. First off, one light source, the sun, 93 million miles away, right? All the shadows running parallel. Mm -hmm. Well, except not in not in this shot. They're, not, they're all like converging. They're, they are going to run into each other. It's not even close. It's it's yeah. not even remotely close. Um, the only way that can happen is if that hot spot, which is behind the photographer, you know, behind the astronaut, is really, really close and really, really small. That's the only way that can happen. Uh, other things you can zoom in. It's a really high quality shot, by the way. The um, there's footprints everywhere, right? Footprints, uh, and the quality of the photography is another sort of a uh, clue that this is a setup oh yeah because the those are, those are beautiful iconic. shots beautiful yeah. shots and but the television footage is something no one would watch i mean it's it's great I, well i mean if you know anything about the history of the television footage where nasa would not give the television networks the, the direct feed they said mm -hmm. no no you have to come to nasa and film it we're going to broadcast it on a screen and you have to film it second generation they're going what what are you talking about? Second generation's crap. In 1969, it's it's utter crap. And so the I remember there was a um a CBS affiliate that watched the you know he, you know guy that owned a station, and he goes he goes this is the worst television footage I've ever seen. He goes I goes I could make a better moon production. And again, he didn't say it was fake. He just said the production value was terrible. He goes in fact I could fake a Mars mission better than this. And he was the guy that financed uh, Capricorn One, the movie. Oh, wow. Yeah, he was, and that was the reason why. Wow. He's like, and he did. I mean, he showed. He's like, oh, here's Capricorn One, because <laughs> like, I could fake a Mars mission, and I, I think during that you could never make that movie now. During the making of it, he's like, yeah, you know what? It is really easy to do this. Really, really easy. But anyway, sorry. Um, footprints, by the way, all over the ash, right? Ash is perfectly three inches thick all over. Nobody ever took a shovel and dug down. It's like, how far can you deep dig in the ash? And you'll see the footprints everywhere, but no crater or no blast left crater from no the landing pattern. of the There should be yeah, no shit. ash. 10,000 pounds <laughs> of thrust under that thing. There yeah. should be no ash under that thing at all. Uh, little and things there, there like should be a dust cloud preventing oh those beautiful photographs that would have been there for, I mean, I don't know. I would assume quite a long time. Yeah. 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 Well, if it's, it's supposedly one sixth earth gravity, by the way, which is a whole nother thing, no feats of strength, 180 pound man weighs, weighs 30 pounds. You know what you could do with that sort of strength? You could, you could pick up those two guys could have picked up the freaking lander if they want to, and definitely could have picked up the moon buggy, but another, Oh my God, there's so many little things. Um, we always see the pictures, and you've seen the, the moon stuff, where you know all they do is increase the, the frame rate 100% and everyone's running just fine. Yes. Like, why would you be in slow motion? Fine, you weigh 30 pounds instead of 180 pounds. You still weigh 30 pounds. It's not like you weigh no pounds. You know, 30, you know, the object still falls at the same rate. That's how it works. You wouldn't be floating everywhere. In fact, if anything, you, um, you, your vertical leap would be ridiculous. I mean, let's say you had a 12-inch vertical leap with the suit, which I think is not un, un, unusual, right? That's six-foot leap. You should be – it would be – what was that movie? Um, the Mars movie with um, uh, Taylor Kit, Kitsch, Kirch, where he was, he was on Mars. Anyway, he was like – he could jump. He, he was teleported to Mars, right? And Mars had an atmosphere, and he could jump incredibly far, and he had to get used to his new strength because he had, he had Mars gravity. Anyway – uh, last but not least, let me throw in one more, and that is that stupid satellite dish, right? That little that little dish looks perfectly legit, right? Well, yeah, it looks kind of legit now, but in 1969, that thing was running off a car battery, right? That thing has a range. Maybe it's it's not secret technology. That's a VHF transmitter. That thing has a range on a good day of 50 miles. 
And even then we're talking Morse code. And you're telling me that thing is pumping out 10 frames of color video a second and perfect two way communication. How you lining it up? Yeah, how, how that you- was one of the things that really got me is just, you know, being that it's 2021. And I've, I've been, you know, looking into this since I was a kid, but even back then, right? Yeah. The idea that we sent a uh, manned mission to the moon 30 years before we had cell phones. Oh, yeah. Uh, before we, before the invent of the 486 computer or even, or the Pentium chip, before any of that. Hell, and then we, we did it in the, in the 60s and then didn't do it anymore since then. Yep. Right. We did these four moon missions and then it was just like, okay, we're done with the moon. No one's going back to the moon. Don't worry about the moon. Don't think about the moon. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the blue marble shot. People don't understand. And I talked about this in the clues, which was the iconic Apollo 17 blue marble shot, right? Taken in 1972 on the last mission going home, the last possible chance you could take the shot. It's like, okay, we're going to take a shot of the earth, the full disc earth and sunlight, and that's it. Roll credits. Good night, everybody. And that's it. And you're right. And you're the thing is they drug it out too far because they were scared to death of faking it. And the, as the technology got better and better is in terms of media, they got even more scared of trying to fake it. I mean, I wouldn't, you, I, I used to joke with people that you could give me a whole dump truck full of money and say, look, we were going to pay you $500 million to fake the moon missions. Now I'd be like, yeah, go, go to hell. <laughs> I, there's no way I could do it. I mean, come on. The, everybody knows, especially in the, the media biz in Hollywood, the bigger the production, the more likely there are going to be huge mistakes. Uh, you know, uh, there's whether, how many websites are there of like moviemistakes.com. I mean, even the original Lord of the Rings, the first cut, you probably remember this. There was a car there's driving a car, in the background yeah. in, the, in the Shire. It's yeah. like, how did you miss that? Right. But yeah. they did. But, that, and I missed it for years and years and years. Loved yeah. that movie. Watched it over and over again until somebody pointed it out to me. I never noticed that car. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you you make mistakes. And so they did not release a second blue marble shot of the earth until summer of 2015 as we started to ramp up. And we called them on it because we because I go, I go, look, it's been 43 years. You haven't taken a second blue marble shot. And I remember when it came out because Scott Kelly was the guy that wrote the press briefing and Obama was the one that did the tweet on it. It's like, you know, second blue marble shot of the earth. Really wonderful. It's like, really? <laughs> Really? That's that's all you're going to say? You're not going to talk about 43 years? That is such a long time in the in the field of space it really is. to yeah. do anything. And even to this day, again, I'll give you a quick argument. Because it's like, look, now it's been 40, uh, almost 50 years. We'll just say 50 years. I think the 50-year anniversary did happen or something along the lines. Where it's like, okay, why hasn't anyone been back? Right? They just keep kicking that can down the road. I remember talking to some science students out in um, Dublin. Right. This one girl in particular. And and I said, look, it's been a long time when you going back. Right. And she goes, soon. We're going back soon. I go, yeah, I've heard that. I go, I heard that. I've heard that since Reagan, (laughs) every president since Reagan. And we've got we've got clips in our circles. That have, got, has, that have have you know this compilation of stuff where every president since Reagan is it's like well we're dedicated we're going back we're going back we're going back Trump we're going back Biden yeah we're not going back <laughs> he's not even trying <laughs> yeah um, anyway. so Mark so tell me what is the state of the flat Earth movement since the release of the Netflix documentary what what's changed what's well, new? before before the documentary we were smoldering pretty good. I mean, we were we were catching a lot of uh, um, media attention just because it was so unique. Uh, the 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 conference, for example, which was shot before the documentary came out, the first conference in 2017. There, a lot of people don't know that media will send scouts like recon. They'll send a single person out to an event to see if it's legit or not. They'll send it before the event, and they because ours was a two day conference, and that first day. I remember seeing these guys around the place and they were like, yeah, you got on the phone, like you, you got to get some teams out here like now. And they overnighted people flew in the middle of the night, all these teams from, from various parts of the world. And it was just freaking nuts. But when the documentary, the, the director and the producers had no faith in it whatsoever. So again, they didn't want to make it for whatever reason. By the time they were done, they regretted making it. They did not push it very hard. They thought, oh, we're not even getting into film festivals, let alone sell the damn thing. And 
They got into every festival they applied to, as far as I could tell, to the point where they were sending me out to festivals, which is a dumb idea. But they were making sure that somebody was live feeding so that I didn't say stuff that was off color, like I would. And they, but they still didn't think it was going to get bought. And it was picked up almost immediately by um, Amazon and uh, iTunes and, and YouTube Red and all this. And then finally, at the end of 2018, we saw it, we saw it 2017 was conference. End of 2018, just around Thanksgiving to 20, that's when Netflix picked it up. And everything just exploded because, and I have a theory behind this. It's because Net, the Netflix documentary gave media an excuse to talk about Flat Earth. So instead of looking up a Flat Earther, asking your producer or your, your editor, it's like, yeah, I, I, we need to meet some Flat Earthers. No, no, no. All you had to do was watch the movie. That was that was our that was our reel that was our sizzle reel, and so they would just show this movie to someone. It's like, yeah, we're gonna do a follow up on on whatever happened with the movie, and so we had we just just exploded. It, there was so many. My email load, I think, doubled in that first month, and it was already pretty heavy. I mean, it was just heavy, heavy, heavy with people because they they couldn't believe that they could track me down. Because I always put my contact information out on, on social media. And if I only have one thing on social media, I don't do Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or Snapchat, whatever the kids are doing nowadays, I don't do it. I just did, I only did YouTube just for the hell of it. In fact, um, quick little little side story. i tell you how unprepared I was for this thing. When um, I get this call from uh, Coast to Coast, a producer at Coast to Coast. And they said, yeah, yeah, well, I, I talk, you were, we heard you were on ground zero. Well, I want you to well, do a thing on Flat Earth. It's like, okay. I, and she goes, um, she goes, what's the um, name of your book? And I go, I, I don't have a book. And she goes, she goes, okay, what's the name of your DVD? And I go, don't, don't have one of those. She goes, okay, what's the name? She goes, what's your website? I didn't have a website. I was like, look, I go, look, I've only been doing this for a few months. I have, she goes, why am I talking to you? I go, you called me. I have no idea why you're, why you're talking to me. And she goes, all right, give me the nickel tour. Go, I'll give you five minutes. I go, bup, 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 bup. and she goes, all right, you're on next week. And I was like, right on. And then I had to ask a friend, I was like, what's coast to coast? That's, that's a thing, right? <laughs> and people got so angry at me anyway. But the, the point was is that no one was prepared now, but then we got me media spoiled. Sorry. What, so after the documentary, everybody was doing a flat earth video. I mean, every, if you could think of a YouTube channel, a big one, whether the kids, I mean, the young channels, like the Paul brothers, Logan Paul punks our conference in Denver the very next year. <sighs> Dumb. Uh, everyone from ABC news to Shane Dawson to uh, international stuff. It, it was it was out of control to where we couldn't even we couldn't even do the interviews fast enough. There were just so many cool things happening, uh, and uh, yes, the opportunities were there. Producers were fishing around for television shows. A good example: there was a um, a mobile company in Australia calls me up, said, "Yeah, can you be in Australia in ten days? Uh, we we want you to uh, we're we're doing um a campaign called Foolproof." Which again, little little knock. Which is well, if these people can use flat Earth or use the, our phone app, anyone can. And I go, do I get to say flat Earth on camera? They go, you betcha, you do. In fact, I helped write my little piece, and they go, they sent me tickets and paid me well, and I I did it. And we were so that was in 2019. 2019 was monstrous. We were doing so amazingly well, and beginning of 2020. I'll give you how things got went. 2020, I get flown out to London to do a morning show, right? With I also did Piers Morgan. I was scared to death of that one because I was like, oh, God. But I didn't do that live, which was even worse because I knew there was a producer. Again, general public doesn't know. In most cases, it's the producers. The on-air talent, they're just talking to you. It's the producers with a kill switch in the back. They're the ones you have to worry about. If they, if they don't like the way you're going, and most of the time they'll they'll be in your earpiece. They'll they'll be like, "All right, we want to change topics, or we want to do this, and we want to do that." And either you go along with it, or you don't. I mean, so, that's such a shame because it's just scripted reality, right? It's it not there it's is, not real. It's it's here's what you're allowed to say, what you're it, allowed to talk about. Absolutely. And I feel like, and this is one of the things that bothers me in the world today, is that we're getting more and more funneled into that restrictive sort of yes. you have to believe the correct things type yeah. of, of environment and uh, and that, that oh, yeah. bothers me a lot 
Yeah, yeah, no, I know. There was a wonderful line by um, Carrie Fisher when she was being asked how, reality, how the reality television market was cutting into all the, the serious actors. And she laughed, right? And this was only a couple of years before she died, where she goes, she goes, you don't get it. She goes, if it's on television, she goes, it's not real. And I was, I'd be the first one to tell you that. I remember, uh, I'll finish up the London thing in a second, how, how everything just collapsed. But um, I remember going to do a, um, a thing with National Geographic down in Los Angeles. They were really persistent. They called me when I was at the Toronto Film Festival. That's where the, the documentary first opened up. And they called me and they said, yeah, we want to do a meetup in Los Angeles. I go, great. I can put you in touch with a whole bunch of Los Angeles people. Here you go. Have fun. Right? Not even two hours later, they're back on the freaking phone with me. So it's like, look, we want you to come out to Los Angeles. I go, look, I don't want to come. They go, we want a meetup. They're looking for production value. And they said, we want a meetup just for us. So schedule a meetup. We're going to, and so the meetup wasn't organic in any way, shape or form. It was, it was scripted just for them. We, it's like, we had just done a meetup in Los Angeles. And I have to go back out again and I'm staying in the hotel. I'm only two doors down from the National Geo. I'm basically married to them for the weekend. And we were, uh, the, this will give you the whole scripted thing. When I'm, and the segment's on YouTube, on their channel. I can't even put it on my channel, which I love, right? Copyright stuff. Can't put it on my channel. No, no, no. And they will absolutely block it. So the, the non-reality part, I met the lady, the on-air talent, this young, blonde, South American woman. I met her for the first time six times. Which means it's like, all right, you're going to meet her. She's going to come across here and you're going to shake hands. Oh, hey, Mark, how's it going? <laughs> hey, okay, we're going to do it from this angle. And, you know, our, our people are walking around just shaking their heads going, oh, man. Yeah. You know, and we did, we did take after take after freaking take with a very organic group of people. So, no, nothing on television is real. Nothing at all. Nothing, nothing, nothing. So, sorry, let, let me get to the crash and I'll go back to some nothings. So 20, beginning of 2020, right? I just get back from the, the news, the morning show and go all the way back to Seattle. And somebody, a guy from McDonald's calls me from London. From London. He goes, okay, so we do a thing in, in the UK called Pancake Day. And I go, yeah. He goes, well, you get it, right? It's flat, it's round. <laughs> and he goes, he goes, we can do a flatter tie-in. He goes, I go, Okay, sure. And he goes, he goes, I'll send, t I'll send tickets. And we were, and in fact, he goes, you can even bring a friend. It's like, all right, we'll make a trip, a little trip of it. And just before the tickets were issued, the lockdown, and that was, that was the end of it. And once the lockdown with, you know, all the borders got sealed off and, and we had to deal with this BS for the last 18 or 15 months or so and change. So we were, we were doing great. Absolutely wonderful. I couldn't have been happier. 2019 was a banner freaking year for everybody. The whole flyer community was doing really, really well. Now we do remote interviews. We did one conference. So like after we did Raleigh the first year, the, the conference you saw in the documentary, we did Denver the second year, which I protested and left early because Logan Paul was there. And the producer didn't even tell us that Logan Paul was going to be there because Logan, if you know who that idiot is, he, he swarmed to secrecy. Anyway, and then uh, the last year, or 2019, was Dallas. And that was a fantastic. <laughs> we, so you'd think, this gives you a, kind of an arc. 2019, Jimmy Kimmel sent a team to punk us. Oh, that was fun. He ended up doing a seven minute skit on us. And uh, I, I actually felt pretty good about it because I didn't know. What he did was he sent a full blown team. You know, it's like, okay, here's my guys, told everyone he was sending people. But then he sends another guy dressed up as a flat earther that paid full, full, full price to get in. We didn't know who he was. And, and I was treating him just like everybody else. And people's like, how did you not know? I go, to be honest, man, because, yeah, this guy was really over the top and drunk and wearing all sorts of flat earth memorabilia. I go, he wasn't the first flat earth, the bad, worst flat earther I've seen even that week. <laughs> I, I go, it's seen worse. That's so I, – I, I really – that bothers me. Um, which you know, I, you I know that it's it's what people do and it's fine and it's entertainment and all that. But just honestly, you know, when someone has a belief that's different than yours, 
you know, the need to attack them. That's something that we need to address. And I was talking to my friend who's a fellow occultist, who's the next guest I'm going to have on the show, yeah. um, Bren. And we were talking about this the other day, and, and we were saying, you know, the, the wonderful thing. Well, let me back up. Let me say, firstly, I practice a form of metaphysics called chaos magic that was introduced to the world by Peter Carroll, mm -hmm. uh, primarily in the early 70s. And one of the, one of the principal axioms of chaos magic is that nothing is true, everything is permitted. And the way that I take that is that your belief system, your, your experience of reality is going to conform to your beliefs about it. We are basically walking, talking computers, like right. super powerful computers. That's what a mind is. It's a computer more powerful than we can really comprehend right now. Right. And it's got programming and that programming in part is your belief system, right? And that kind of brings us back to another um, teaching that I'm, I'm very familiar with and very um, active with is the hermetic principles. And the first hermetic principle is that the all is mental, right? The universe is a mental construct. And this is demonstrable in neuroscience. Everything that you experience that you think is real, this desk, my coffee here, my, yeah. you know, the, all this equipment, you think of it as being real and solid, but we know that it's made of atoms that are farther apart from each other than the, you know, the totality of the, the mass of the atom. It's 99.9% .9 empty space. Everything right. you experience is 99.9% .9 empty space. 99.99999, actually. It's right. all constructed in your mind. Yeah. None of this is real. In fact, uh, Donald Hoffman has a great series of videos about this, about how the mind constructs reality. And, and he refers to, you know, physical objects in your three dimensional space as icons, like icons on a desktop. And there's so much more happening around us than we're aware of because we only interact with a tiny, 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 tiny fraction of the visible light spectrum and a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the sound spectrum, right? right. And again, this is going back to like Neil deGrasse Tyson and Elon Musk talking about us being in a, in a simulation or a hologram. Well, right. how, who's to say that I'm not decoding the simulation in a different way than you are, Yeah. right? And that we aren't each experiencing reality in a way that's very unique to us. Which in software is called instancing. Absolutely. Which is you what what we can do that in software now, and we heck, heck, we've been we've been trying to perfect it for the last 20 years, which is what you see on the screen and what I see on the screen, even though we're supposedly looking at the exact same object, can look completely different to us. It is not hard to do. Uh, no, and, and that that idea is espoused in so many ancient teachings though yeah. you know what is of one form and shape to one is not the same to another and yet we, oh, hell, we what, believe that they are <laughs> what, remember the old saying beauty is in the eye of the beholder that's not mm -hmm. just a saying you know you wonder why some people it's like that's the most beautiful thing ever and other people it's like oh my god that's butt ugly and it, come on it, it you're absolutely right i mean even little things like i i joke that uh, the best pictures of the year, you know, whatever wins best picture back when it used to mean something, there was, there were still people that write reviews say, this is, this thing was absolutely a piece of trash. And it's like, yeah, won nine Oscars, including best picture. Like, yep. Doesn't matter. I still hate it. And they genuinely hate it. Or the little things like the, the, the dress is the black, the dress black, or is it white? That was the one that really threw me. Uh, if you remember that, where you looked at the picture and, Seven out of 10 people in the room would see a black dress with whatever tint, and the other one would see white. And they would be standing side by side, staring at the exact same image. And you could give them all polygraphs, and they would all pass. It's like, what color is the dress? It's white. What color is the dress? It's black. Who, in fact, at that point, who's lying? Exactly. So as, as a sort of thought experiment, I was thinking about this in kind of preparation for our conversation, and I was doing this sort of thought experiment in my head. Let's say that you and I were the only two people on the earth, oh. and I say it's round and you say it's flat, and there is no third person to give an objective opinion. Now we live in divergent realities, and there is no consensus reality. It takes, it takes large groups of people with the same belief systems to create a consensus reality. Yeah. right? And for the consensus reality for most of human history is that the world was flat. Uh, I'm, I'm currently studying Norse paganism and the Norse myths, and one of the first things in the Norse myths is that the world is a great round, flat disc uh, held up by Yggdrasil, the world tree. And, you know, all the Abrahamic faiths had their own version of flat earth. And, and I, the reason for that, obviously, in my opinion, is that experientially, 
the world is flat. You will never, ever experience the curvature of the earth. There are certainly, you know, clues. And, and again, to me, it takes, it takes too much suspension of disbelief for me personally to think the world is flat. Uh, and this has to do with me being a student of astrology as well. But astrology is actually geocentric. It does rely on there being space and planets. So, I mean, to, for me to say space is fake is kind of like, well, then everything I believe, right? Um, and I, I would I would politely disagree in that aspect, only that uh, th- are there planets up there? Yes. Do they have to be millions and billions of light years away? No. No, they don't. I mean, again, the, when you go, uh, the argument I've given to people over the years is when you walk into a planetarium, because I've had people say, amateur astronomers say, I've seen the moons of Jupiter through my telescope. I go, great, fantastic. Go to a planetarium, bring a pair of binoculars. Look at Jupiter. It's like, yep, I see it. You see the moons of Jupiter binoculars? Yep. Can you land on it? No. Why not? Well, because it's just a pretty image on the ceiling. I go, who's to say when you walk out of that building, you're just not in a much, much bigger building. Right. And that, so that brings me to, you know, kind of, and, and, you know, for my listeners out there, like, let's go ahead and suspend our disbelief. Let's, let's like explore this because it's fun and it's just interesting. And that's what I'm trying to do here. I, it, again, I'm just going to say this a couple of times because it really pissed me off to see how many YouTube channels there are out there that exist solely to poke fun at you or be mean to you or say that you're an idiot. You know, all of those people can go straight to hell in my opinion. Aww, right? Because it's nice. Well, it's well, what's the point? What's the well? I mean, there's a come on, hits and, and views, you, you, sure, but you you know, there's a lot of hate out there. There's a yeah. lot of angry. I, I, you're old enough. I'm, I'm old enough. I was there when the first forums showed up on the internet, and I saw how ugly it got long yeah. before YouTube. Wait a minute, I can say whatever I want in this this forum. And there's no repercussions at all. I can just rip into people. I people I then they'll never figure out who I am. The the running joke on um oh what is it the Jay and Silent Bob movie, where they spent all their movie money and tracked down all these people and beat the shit out of them. <laughs> oh yeah. And and, and well, you feel and you feel like that. But the same thing the the what I tell people I like, go the t shirt I I I could make money on the off a t shirt like this, which is you've heard the saying. If you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all, right? Mm-hmm. I don't believe that anymore. If you can't say something nice, you're probably in the YouTube forums. That's, <laughs> that's, that's what happens. I mean, I, in fact, I ran into a video just the other day that went 384 thumbs up, no thumbs down. I thought it was a freaking miracle, but I knew it was our circles, so nobody found it. I'm sure somebody. But usually you can't even go 100 thumbs up without somebody coming in and doing a thumbs down. It's a point of pride for them. It's like, ooh, no thumbs down? Right on. Here we go. Thumbs down, and I'm going to comment. It's like, you suck, this sucks, everything sucks, and your religion, and your mom. Yeah. And and they don't even know you. And so so back to, I, I realized I kind of trailed off, and I do that. But back to this conversation I was having with my friend, Bren. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we feel, she's also a chaos magician, when we feel that one of the great things that you learn through, you know, working through metaphysical practices is, is that, we don't believe in objective truth in, in the way that, you know, most normal people do. Um, and one of the great things about that is it gives you this ability. Okay. So I have no egoistic investment in proving you wrong. I just don't care. I don't have my own objective truth that you can threaten in a way that makes me react to you right. like that to, to need to destroy you. And I think that that's what people have this visceral reaction when you challenge their, uh, perception of reality that like I'm going to fuck this person up because they've well, challenged my perception of reality. And when you have the ability to to say, you know, I don't need to do that to somebody, then it gives you the ability to sit down and listen to them and listen to their uh, yeah. reality and maybe take in something new or, or learn something or like even just, you know, go off on a little adventure in your head. Why not? The The Neo principle does kind of apply here, which is with every other conspiracy, you don't have to look at it. You don't want to look at JFK or 9-11 or Pearl Harbor or the moon. You don't have to look at that stuff. There are secrets that can be buried in the desert and you never have to deal with it ever. Wow, the sun came out. Go figure. So, the, um, however, when it comes to this, in fact, I, I remember there's a call-in show where I had an older gentleman call me uh, or called in this show and he goes, how dare you? 
how dare you tell me the world isn't what I think it is. And that's really what it comes down to. It's like, this is not something you can, you can ignore it, but you can't run away from it because once it's in your head, it's going to rattle around like a marble in a paint can. And you, you got to resolve it one way or the other. It's like, you either got to say, Nope, not going to look at it and just hope to God it doesn't rattle too much. Or you got to deal with it. And that's where people, people get the, the five stages of acceptance absolutely apply with this topic. You know, denial, anger, <laughs> almost hand in hand, uh, bargaining, depression, and finally acceptance. Everybody goes through it. Um, it's the most unsatisfying thing of our community in that there's so many people that once they get in, once they flip, they, because you want to become a flat earther, they, they forget the journey. They forget all that time it took, whether it's two weeks or two months or whatever. And they think, you know what? I've got it. I understand it. I can convince my friends and family in an hour or maybe over Thanksgiving dinner. And so every day or every year during the holidays, I have to say, don't go to Thanksgiving and drop this on people. It's going to backfire. It's going to go really, really horrible. You might as well tell people, tell your family. Uh, you're a gay heroin addict that is now going into, you know, this change in the religion that, that you might as well be all those three things. The, the families aren't going to react well in most cases. And yeah, I mean, I, we've seen divorces. We've seen families that, that, that not veiled threats of institutionalism, institutionalize, whatever. So yeah, sorry. Anyway. And yeah, the same thing happens uh, along the spiritual path. That's certainly true. It's not exactly the same, but you know, when you have a spiritual awakening experience and you go from maybe being an atheist to someone who understands that there's another side to reality, it's so jarring and you want to tell all your friends about it. Let's say you, let's say you met your spirit guide and you had an experience that was profound to you. You want to go tell everybody, but they're all going to look at you like you're nuts. Yeah. They, they all are, you know, and that's okay. Part of accepting that is your growth. That's and spirituality is about growth and you need to grow to the point where you realize like other people don't have the same beliefs as you and that's okay. In fact, everybody has some kind of divergent belief and they probably don't talk about it a lot, but you know, you could, you could sit next to your, your closest friend and I'll bet that somewhere in there is a belief that, that would separate you, you know, if you, if you were to really oh, yeah. explore it, but that's okay. Right. We're, we're uh, 8 billion individuals and we have the right to have our own ideas and beliefs and and you know the ways that we experience yeah, the world yeah absolutely and and i don't blame people for for coming at us i mean it's a very it's the most polarizing topic i've ever seen it's the only thing we debunk to children you know you put the globe in the classroom and you leave it there for 12 years it's a really powerful thing and the mm -hmm. cia would pay good money for that sort of conditioning and it's secondary only to the flag Meaning the flag is in the corner of your classroom. That's there for 12 years. And at the end of your 12 years, there's people that join the military partially based on the fact they've staring at that flag so long. It's like, this is where I live. Globe, what's the difference? This is where I live. And then all of a sudden we come along and say, yeah, that's not where you live. People get, it's almost like telling somebody, I've seen it. It's almost like telling somebody when they're 30 or older that they're adopted. No. It's that sort of power because all of a sudden, and if you, they, if it clicks at all, they have to revisit it because it ripples back in time to where all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, that globe has been with me since I was, you know, since I was in knee highs. Do people say that anymore? doesn't really matter. Anyway, sorry, go on. Yeah, I just remember, um, you know, when I had my, my initial spiritual awakening experience, um, now I had been an occultist since I was a teenager studying the occult and occult sciences, uh, astrology, tarot, things like that. But when I had the first really powerful experience, it was only in 2018. And I went through all those stages of this is, this is real. Like I've just discovered this thing. I need to tell everybody, okay, people don't want to hear about this. Okay. This is about personal growth. And you just move through those stages. Um, anyways, though, so, so on to this, the next thing I want to do here, Mark, is I want to kind of throw out some other conspiracies that I've been involved with in my life or been, or been interested in and ask you kind of how flat earth would work with these other ideas sure. that I'm very interested in. So the first one is Atlantis. I think that, you know, how does the story of Atlantis fit in with flat earth? What do you think about that? I have no problem. Honestly, there are so very few, I'll, I'll preface it with this. There are so very few conspiracies that don't dovetail into flat earth. Cause remember flat earth means we're in this giant snow globe 
and everything is inside it, including every other civilization. I don't know. I, I owned, I remember the first six or seven seasons of Ancient Aliens on DVD. I was one of the few people that actually went out and bought them. And I still enjoy them to this day. I think they're really great. I think they leave out some stuff, but, uh, but I think it's interesting. That's the, the next one I was going to ask you about. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll do this we'll Atlantis thing first, yeah. which is Atlantis. Look, look we are not, I, I have said this for six years. We are not the first people to rent this apartment, no not by any stretch. Mm -hmm. And we are very arrogant. Science is, is really good about not acknowledging that. It's like, nope, it's just us. Anything before us is pure speculation. And what science loves doing is everything is a myth until we say it's not. And the, the most obvious, of course, those would be like cryptozoology. People, people don't get how science just drags their heels. I mean, the giant panda was a myth and they laughed at it until they found one. The giant anaconda, uh, anaconda was a myth. The giant squid was an absolute myth. Still can't catch one of those suckers. We're never gonna. They're too fast. They're too fast. They dive faster and you know better. Than, better I, than I personally believe that there's bigger things down there. I mean, we don't oh, know probably. much about the ocean. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. We, there's so many things that we. But science. The point is, is that science um, digs in their heels. The the coelacanth fish, which I love bringing up to people. I, I talked about in my 2018 speech, which was. It's, oh, no, it's been extinct for 70 million years, at least. 70 million years, extinct. Then they caught one in, off a of net in, off of um, uh, South Africa, and then one off of Madagascar, and then Mozambique. And then pretty soon they figured out, basically, they're all over the place, all south of Africa. But if you would have asked any scientist in 1940, you know, the, to bet the freaking farm on it, they all would have. It's like they laughed and then laughed and laughed. And then once they fight, figured out finally it was real, they had to reevaluate everything and say, uh, re just make up terms. It's like, no, no, it's a living fossil. It's in an evolutionary state of stasis. And it's like, now you're just making it up. It's like, yeah, you can't just say, okay, we were wrong. It's there. Yeah. My, my saying, which is the opposite of Neil's, is like, science is only true until the day it's not. They put their stamp on it. That's the thing that pisses me off about science, which is, it's like the giant panda. We're going to laugh at you. We're going to laugh at you. Oh, wow. Look, there's a giant panda. Well, it's part of science now. <laughs> now yeah. Gonna... And that's, you know, how I personally, you know, I, of course I'm biased and I'm perfectly willing to be biased. Um, that's how I feel it's going to happen with astrology. This is, to, to me, this is a demonstrable fact. Mm -hmm. you, there's nothing you can do to convince me that astrology is not legitimate. I've spent too many years noticing that this oh, yeah. is legitimate. And I actually spent a, a lot of the years kind of being like, yeah, maybe until I dug really deep into it. And I'm like, Oh, definitely. Then there's a lot of people in our community that, um, that absolutely are into astrology. No question. Well, like yeah. I said, it's geocentric. It, yeah. it does have that in common with flat earth. And I found that to be interesting. Uh, yeah. And I figured that out through watching the documentary. I think that's, well, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, there's always, you can always find shared beliefs people, even when they're, when they're, you don't share their beliefs, you can find common ground. Yeah. Um, so I'm sorry, what was the next one? That is interesting. Um, but yeah, so the next one I was going to bring up, and this is the one that really, because I spent many years, like you, I don't own the DVDs, but I've seen every single episode of Ancient Aliens. Yeah. Uh, I watch that show religiously. I love it. I just, I, I'm not going to say I believe this, but I'm going to say I love the show. <laughs> I yeah, love the no, idea. It's a well done. In fact, I, I remember talking to producers a couple of years ago, and I said, if you want to turn Flat Earth into a show, I go follow the ancient aliens format. I'm surprised you don't have your own show on the history I, channel to be perfectly you know why? honest. Because the producers are scared to every producer. They're scared to death. I can't tell you how many you'll get backlash. Even with your channel, you'll get backlash from people that say, how dare you even give them a platform? Oh yeah. I'll get, I know. I spoke to my buddy about that. Uh, he was saying, you know, I really want to talk to Mark Sargent. And I said, should I do it? And he's like, of course you should do it. You fucking wuss. You know what I mean, like, <laughs> he's right. Well, yeah, he's yeah. been in the public eye People, before. He's like, you're going to get, you can't be afraid of the backlash. I've had it, everyone from television producers to network producers to hell, Alex Jones. Alex Jones was nervous to do the show. They, their producers said, how long can we do a show on Flat Earth without actually saying the words Flat Earth? And I go, 10 minutes, maybe if I dance around, they go, yes, yeah, sorry, we can't do it. We can't, we can't risk the audience. Yeah. So ancient aliens, the, the format of the show, I think is brilliant. And I think it could be applied for anything. And I absolutely I said, look, all you have to do is take out the word ancient aliens, replace it with flat earth, and then follow the script as normal with a narrator. And, you know, just send the people around as I go, there's your show. 
I mean, it's a proven formula. It absolutely will work. I mean, they they ran for freaking ever. Well, and it requires a whole lot of suspension of disbelief to to buy into the ancient alien theory as well. But there's so much evidence that is so interesting. Yeah, I mean, and at it the end, makes they, you they, wonder, they not, and I think that people need to have that wonder in their lives. It's yeah. part of being mentally healthy. Yeah. Actually, at, at the end of that show, they don't beat you over the head with it. They, it's always this open-ended question. It's always yeah. could Puma Punku and the ruins and the, that lie therein prove ancient aliens? And they don't. They just kind of trail off. That's how it ends. It's like mm-hmm. they don't. They're not going to tell you. It's like it proves it, or you're stupid if it, or maybe possibly not. No, they just leave it to you. And, and you, that's the yeah. way it should be. A person should be completely. Um, open to and comfortable with believing what they believe. And then, yeah. you know, everyone out there who's listening, you should know you definitely believe something that someone will think you're crazy for. So, yeah, I mean, that's I, all right. It, I, and I love, I love the ancient alien show. And do I believe in, in a lot of the stuff they did? Yeah. Yeah, I, I do. Um, a lot of it's very I, compelling. <laughs> I, I love the, the ruins that aren't underwater. The, I mean, yes, the sunken cities off of Japan and the sunken cities off of India, which you're never going to look at well because of the currents. But uh, Puma Hunku, I think it's an amazing site. And who knows? It probably is just some meaningless thing in the, in the you know, uh, it's probably just a stupid little construction site from, you know, way, 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 way back. But to us, it's absolutely intriguing. Or those, um, those wonderful rocks that seem to be melted together in the hills in Peru. I yeah, think? because we believe as, as a society, as a species, as a culture, uh, you know, not obviously not everyone, but um, – the majority of us, I think, believe that, that civilization started 7,000 years ago. Oh, yeah. And then yeah. now uh, Golbeke Tepe is completely uh, pushing that back to, I think, I believe 12,000 years, right? And mm. it's going to get pushed back again. This is what we're going to discover is that it keeps getting pushed back farther and farther and farther, That's you know, right. and we're going to realize that we don't know shit. <laughs> no, we don't. No, we don't. History history is, I, I believe, lost on a regular basis. And then once it's lost, people don't... I'll give you a great example. I was thinking about, imagine modern day, here's, here's how fast things can go downhill to where you lose all that. Let's say there is some sort of apocalypse, not this virus crap, an actual apocalypse. And the, the military goes into their bunkers, Cheyenne Mountain, right? Great. They go into the mountains and they lock themselves in there. In less than a generation, you lose almost all relevant education. And in a couple generations, you lose, you could lose language. You yes. could lose a lot of stuff because we're, we are on a foundation of basically stained glass. It is very precarious where we are. We could, we could go backwards in such a ma- quick amount of time. The, um, there was a great movie, uh, um, well, unless you don't like Tom Cruise, Oblivion, where Tom Cruise and the clones where the, the the big giant weird satellite in the sky that was basically sucking the oceans out. And there was only Tom Cruise's running around and Morgan Freeman was alive. He was, of course, Morgan Freeman, he was alive to tell the tale and he was trying to regale of, of how the things that happened, what earth was like beforehand. But it, you could tell there would only been like 40 years or so. And in that 40 years, everything was gone. So here's, here's what I'm getting at. Meaning the kids that grew up in that, if all of a sudden Cheyenne Mountain opens up and helicopters start flying out, they have no idea what they're looking at. They, they don't have books. They, they didn't reference anything. It's like, what the hell are those things? So when it comes to old versions of us, the ancient aliens, which I don't think are aliens. I just think they're old versions of us. Uh, yeah. I, I'm I very open to that possibility as well. It's one of the most compelling arguments um, because I, I can I think that what the show demonstrates, I don't think that the show Ancient Aliens – I hate the word proof. I don't think anything's really provable. Like there's consensus reality, right? Not really proof. But I don't think that ancient aliens proves anything about aliens, but it does to me prove that human civilization is not what well, we don't know much about it. The pyramids, for example, that's a matter of technology, not hard work. Those right. could not have been built without advanced technology. And You're that's absolutely really I, I, obvious. I went to the pyramids just because of that statement. I'm so jealous. Oh, it's one of my. It's on my bucket list. I went to you, uh, Teotihuacan in Mexico, climbed to the top, sat there. It was beautiful. Felt the nice. energy. But I've never been uh, to to Egypt, and it's definitely. On I've, my bucket I had heard too many people say that if you see the pyramids, you look at it and you all you you know the little factoids in your head about what the hell you're looking at. But the point is, is that when you look at these pyramids and you spin around and you look at Cairo, 
now, you're going, yeah, these guys had nothing to do <laughs> with the building of this. Exactly. Nothing do- it's not something we could replicate now with no. all of our technology and our machines. No. We couldn't do it. We could not no. replicate those pyramids and- in their perfection or in their size or oh, just yeah. the scope of the project. We could not do it. Well, I, well, we could go on about this. I mean, the, the fact that there's no, not a single hieroglyphic that even explains anything of how it was built. And you know full well. I mean, look, all, all the pharaohs is like, oh, it took us 30 years. And it's like, yeah, how'd you do it? It took us 30 years. Like, what? Or, <laughs> or the fact that the, the, the most notable thing that everyone seems to miss is the fact that the Sphinx was obviously a lion that they took the head and just and turned it into a pharaoh's head because the pharaoh's head is way too small for the body. Yeah, way it too does, small. It's it's like, obviously been modified. And yeah. if it was a lion, and then what was, was the climate? Yeah, if it was a lion, and Dr. Robert Schock is correct, and the correct age of the Sphinx is 12,000 years. Yeah. Well, 12,000 years ago, that lion would have been facing directly at the constellation of Leo. Oh, good. Very and would it have been would it have been a savanna out there as well? Would it even have been a desert? No, it would have been green yeah. at the time, and there would have yeah. been massive rainfall. And that's one of the arguments that um, Robert Schock makes is that there is water erosion on the Sphinx that dates mm-hmm. it to twelve thousand years. Well, um, hey, one one more thing about ancient aliens because I want to mention that even that show pulls back, meaning that I think there are uh, the we'll call them the lower level puppet masters. Because there was an instance in that show, which I can only call it later, because the, the greatest UFO sighting, in my opinion, was the, the 1561 Nuremberg event, if you know about it. And there's a wonderful woodcut. I mean, if you, anyone who doesn't know the story, anyone's listening to this. Um, beautiful April morning, Nuremberg, Germany, 1561. Not a cloud in the freaking sky. Two giant space aircraft carriers just show up over town and start going, to, going at it just slug fest, you know, and for a solid hour, just a freaking solid hour and just hammering on each other. I mean, hours is a long time in, in terms of air battle to where, and granted, there were no cameras, but the, but there was fully enough for a sketch artist, you know, to, to start drawing stuff. People are having their breakfast, finishing their breakfast, you know, they're, they're, what were they? I've you know? seen the paintings, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, they're, well, there's woodcuts. There's, mm-hmm. Look it up if you get a chance. It's wonderful. However, here's where it gets interesting. The part that Ancient Aliens, they did a little segment on this. The part they left out was the most interesting part, which was after that hour, a single giant angular black ship comes in, a third faction, pulls in right between them and stops. Those two groups scatter freaking leave as fast as humanly possible and then that ship stays there for a while and then leaves and the reason why ancient aliens didn't bring that up is it gives it way more credibility because it's almost too credible for for the show meaning okay there's three questions one who the hell were those guys that were uh that, that pulled in are they the un are they the police two why were the other two groups which outnumbered this this ship it's like and they had fighters why weren't they prepared to, to duke it out? Why obviously scared to death of them? And three, what sort of response time is an hour? An hour is, I can fire gunshots out this window. I'm on an island in the middle of nowhere. There will cops be here in under 10 minutes. An hour and you're having a full military engagement and nobody shows up for a full hour? The hierarchy questions? Oh, just wonderful stuff. Anyway. Yeah, for sure. And that's But they the left things- that part out. Yeah. They let that part I, I out do of the show. think that they've presented some evidence on that show that is so compelling, though. It's, it's undeniable. Like, for example, all of these ancient paintings that have depictions of UFOs in them. Oh, my God. They're everywhere. Yeah. It's, it's unreal. And it's like you look at these paintings, and this is one of the most interesting things about, about the human brain is that your brain will just edit it out because it doesn't really want you to see it. It's not relevant to you. And so just like that car in Lord of the Rings – having watched the movie a hundred times and never once noticed the car, your brain has this uh, filter effect where it doesn't pick up on things that aren't relevant to what you're, no, you know, you think you're, you're experiencing. Focused, you're focused on the hobbits. You're, you're not looking anywhere in that part of the screen. You're not going to look in that part of the screen. There's no reason for you to look up on that screen. But these depictions of UFOs are like everywhere in ancient artwork. Yeah. I mean, everywhere. Yeah, yeah, they are. And yeah, in fact, absolutely- so this is one of the one of the ideas that I had. Okay, and again, uh, you know, I, I sat there and I, I suspend my disbelief and I said, "What if the world really is flat?" Yeah. And then I remembered the story of Nibiru, 
and the Anunnaki and and kind of some of the creation myths. And one of them, uh, there's a story that Nibiru, you know, has this long orbit, comes around every 3,600 years, I believe. And in in one instance, it actually struck the Earth. Well, that could account for the creation of the moon. And, you know, in this creation myth, the planet that Nibiru strikes is Tiamat. And Tiamat was this giant watery planet. Right. And what if they just smash right into Tiamat and what and, and, and this is this is a disaster and, and they're this advanced civilization. And they're like, shit, what are we gonna do? We can't let this whole planet full of people and, and living things just die. So right. maybe there's a chunk left of it in outer space, right? And they put, put a dome on it. Save it. Dome it. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I've heard, you know, I've heard this. Yeah. Yeah, stick a dome right on top of the piece of Tiamat that's left. Sure. Uh, and that's kinda, you know, what I in preparation for our thing here, I just kind of drew the, <laughs> the dome nice. while I'm taking my notes. And I thought, you know, that at very least is an excellent sci-fi story, you know? Oh, yeah. and, and, and I don't, I'm open to anything, man. You know, one of the things that, that I think about sometimes when I look outside and I look at the sky, especially if I see like a really beautiful sunset, really beautiful clouds, it looks like a painting. Yeah. It's too beautiful to be real. You know, <laughs> I used to, I, years ago, I, I was thinking about the, when I was doing the video game stuff, how, what the difference was between the, the, the worlds, which we were building and this world and really just came down to a few senses and better resolution. You know, the, the yeah. artwork we we've got the artwork now we can, heck, we can make people that are, look better than real people, you know, that actually, but it's something we've been striving for for a long time, but yeah, you're absolutely right. I, I've this, well, we can get into it later, but there are things now that just scream to me. The The reason why I I like talking about simulations and you're one of the few people that I, I get to talk about it a little bit with is that the general public doesn't understand it even now. Right. They, they don't, don't believe that the simulation could ever be more real than reality. But well, this is they, absolutely possible. They don't get uh, some of them. Don't even get the basic concepts. Look, look, the Matrix is twenty two years old now. It's old, and they didn't. They didn't get the first time. They didn't get the thirteenth floor. They didn't get all the versions of the thirteenth floor all the way up to that point. So I, I say that I have to start out with the basic, basic concept, which is like, look, the world's flat. However, it's probably enclosed, and if it's flat and it's closed, it's probably digital. And you know you're taking big leaps, and if you if people can get that far, most people can't. Most people they just don't they just do not get it because they the virtual reality to them they think oh it's computers and techie stuff and I can't even you know get my Windows to update. Well, it's interesting because you know you could go say I think this is all simulation, you know, yeah. ten years ago, and everyone would be like <laughs> okay, and treat you exactly like you're saying the world's flat. Same thing, but Elon Musk now says. It's a simulation. Everyone's like, "Yep, it's a simulation." <laughs> Elon Musk said so, so it's a simulation. Yeah, I, I yeah. am not. I am. Well, you haven't read any of the stuff I've done recently, but Elon and I do not like that man. Just because, really? No, and and it's only because he represents something that has always bugged me in the media, and that is when you become a billionaire, you can say whatever you want. And the media will publish it, no matter because it's like you have a, you the the money for whatever reason the money automatically gives you instant credit, but it doesn't matter where the money came from, right? You ask anyone, it's like it's like who founded Tesla Motors? Oh, Elon Musk. Nope, he bought Tesla Motors. It's like you know, did he did he found SpaceX? Yeah, kinda. It's like okay, where to get his money? I go, he was one of the early IPO guys. He helped develop PayPal. That's his claim to fame. And he now gets to any statement. Sorry, I don't want to go off on a, too much of a jag on Elon. If you love him, hey, great, fantastic. No, but, but I mean, there, this is what I'm saying. Like, I, I do think he's great, but I, I, I'm not offended by opposing views. He, <laughs> and I think that's the problem with the world is that people are out there, they get offended by absolutely everything. And if you say something they don't agree with, they're going to fight you about it. I'm not going to fight Oh, no, no, no. no. In, in, <laughs> in, in my case, he makes, the reason why he caught my attention was back in 2017 when I read this headline where he said, oh, I'm going to take two tourists around the moon and back. You know, we're not going to land. We're just going to fly around the moon, like, you know, a Sunday drive. Uh, and we're going to do it in, in the middle of 2018. I remember stopping dead in my tracks when I was reading this article. It's like, 
that's the most aggressive space timeline I've ever heard in my life. I go, that's, it's so far out there. It's like, why are you even publishing this story? I go, you don't even have, you don't have a rocket. You don't have a capsule. You don't have a crew. You don't, you don't have a, who are the hell are your passengers? It's just, what are you doing? And of course it did not happen. And then I start looking into the other stuff where he just makes, it's almost like he's a futurist, but the claim, he even he could even make futurists blush. It's like, I'm going to make a high speed rail line from Los Angeles, San Francisco. No, I'm going to make a special plane. That's going to go from us to China in two hours. It's going to cost as much as a business class ticket. No, I'm going to save those kids in that cave with my little submarine. No, I'm going to say, I'm going to, I'm going to solve the Puerto Rico power problem after the hurricane with my special solar generators. No, he doesn't, <laughs> nothing happened. And then all of a sudden, and the SpaceX moon thing didn't happen. And all of a sudden he gets this contract with NASA and he's now the main guy to the ISS and never has a problem. Just goes up. They don't even wear suits anymore. They just, they go up with pol in polo shirts and khakis. And it's like, they're not even trying. They're not even, they're not even freaking trying. Watch the last mission. I'm going there beforehand. They, they said they, they took, they had their suits in the dragon capsule and then they took them off. Now they're not even showing them. And they're literally just wearing polo shirts. It's like, that's, it, can people buy it because it's on the news and whatever anyway sorry so no elon no, is it's not okay. um, it's very interesting <laughs> oh he so he dry seriously every time he makes a comment so when he was making the virtual reality comment which was interesting because he was in a group of people and the fact that all those other scientists oh yeah very well well sure because the quantum computing thing is starting to really grab hold and it's like oh there could be other realities it's like you think we talk oh, there about absolutely it. are. We live we live in a quantum universe with yeah. many worlds, uh, yeah. and I think that that's you know I think that any physicist is kind of has come to that conclusion that the many worlds interpretation of quantum physics is the most likely, and it fits in with this simulation theory, and it you know fits in with with a lot of um, sort of the like I was going back to the hermetic principles of mentalism and consciousness and the way that you know you as an individual your your the reality, the universe that you exist in is a creation of your own mind. And so as yeah. many minds as there are, that's how many universes there are, at least. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, the um the the FDR saying from World War II, which was only tell the people as much truth as they can handle and no more. Because the general public cannot handle you know, the Jack Nicholson line. You can't handle the truth. It's that is true though. The the general public can't can't take it. We'll look at Roswell. I would say, I mean, yes, but I would say also that if they, if I'm right, if my way of thinking is right, then you know, some of the most powerful people in the world, or, or you know, in antiquity even, may have understood that there is no such thing as objective truth, and so they have to create a sort of consensus reality. They like we need everyone to agree on what we say is the truth, so that this situation can become manageable, yeah. right? This this like coexisting together on a planet needs to be manageable, and so if we can get everyone to kind of believe one thing, and that's what every religion is trying to do, is sell you a yeah. prepackaged view of reality. Um, Conformity you know, building empires. Get that, yeah, yeah, exactly. But if everyone were aware that they're manifesting their own experience of reality and they could make it into whatever they want it to be, then you've got a, a disaster at your hands, potentially. If people knew how powerful they were as individuals to tailor and create their own experience of reality. In fact, in the documentary, one of the at, towards the end, the science writer guy is, as, is saying, like, where are you constructing your reality? And, and in my head, I'm like, everywhere. Everyone is constructing their reality everywhere. That's how it works. You just don't realize that you're doing yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Totally with you. And, and that's, that's like becoming aware of the simulation or, you know, um, uh, is sort of a Buddhist saying is becoming awake within the dream. Yeah. You know, you realize that this isn't what it seems, yeah. that this is all I not what it seems. If conformity builds empires, though, then the puppet masters, I, I and I get it. I'm one of those few people in the conspiracy world that I understand the greater good. I put myself in the other person's shoes. It's like, okay, why are you doing this exactly? And if I agree with what you're doing, you know, do the ends justify the horrible means? Eh, you know, the Spock line, you know, needs of the many, needs of the few. But mm -hmm. would the public benefit? So people say, well, okay, what, why didn't you tell people? Why didn't the people know? Why didn't they just tell them when they figured it out in 1960? Which is, by the way, 
in my opinion, how long it took them to even figure out the world was a snow globe or was a building. We didn't know. We didn't have the tech until 1960 to figure it out. Do you tell the general public? No. No, you don't. Not 1960, you don't. They, you, they could barely hang on. They were barely hanging on as it was. You know, the Cold War was in full effect, even though that, I think, was kind of an illusion. Uh, so can you tell them now? Yeah, maybe, but use it to your advantage. I think it was one of those decisions was made along the, the probably the, the shortest smoking man X-Files movie or meeting ever, you know, in the dark room, whatever. It's like, it's like, okay, what do we do? Do we tell them? No, really bad things could happen. Let's just hold on to this until we can spin it in our direction, until the infrastructure is in place. And now here we are, you know. I, I do definitely think that that is part of what happens with, with so many of these conspiracies. And, and particularly, from, you know, from my point of view regarding UFOs and, and let's say the moon landing also, because I've kind of expressed how I feel about that. I feel like once they get stuck in a lie, it's like, okay, well, we'll tell them the truth someday but just not not right now they can't handle it right now right because yeah. they don't want the responsibility of, of like well we have to say we lied to you yeah you know and well, and you, they may they can say forever yeah we'll, we'll tell them later but it'll always be later the only lot the only way you could get out of that is if you had there's a couple things that are bigger than flat earth one would be the existence of another civilization coming to light and they could show and, up and, and, and i think that, that could happen at any minute look at how many ufos we've seen lately yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. they're starting to really talk about it. And if they showed up, all they'd have to do, even whether it's real or not, is just say, okay, just so you know, we told all the governments not to say anything. That's it. And it's like, they're off the hook. And, and that's it. And so you look, oh, well, the aliens told them. And it's like, well, what are you going to do? You know, the, if it was under threat or for promise or whatever. Uh, yeah. So, but anyway, do I think that, that the public is ready for something now? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I mean, I think we're in the middle of something really bizarre. Anyway, sorry. We are definitely in the middle of something really bizarre. And, you know, from my perspective, I, I kind of think of it as the great awakening. People are yeah. waking up to the truth. I'm not going to tell you what that truth is because I don't know. And I believe it's extremely arrogant to say I know the truth, sure. right? For anybody, no matter what. You may be the closest person to the truth, but what what even is truth? Right. right? Um, but I definitely think that people all around the world are waking up to the realization that things are not what they seem. Yeah. And it's one of the most interesting times to be alive in the history of humanity for that reason. All of these, you know, ancient prophecies are, are becoming uh, interesting to us again. We're getting yeah. interested in consciousness and in evolution and, and in realizing that things aren't necessarily what they seem. And, you know, I'm not even, I'm not even necessarily a proponent of the simulation theory, but I think it's fascinating that people are open to this and that they're realizing that, that their experience of reality is not as simple as it, as it's made out to be. So what about the face on Mars? What do you think about that? Um, I think it's an interesting, I think it's a reinforcement story, like everything else in space. So you could lump the face on Mars with the hexagram on the top of Saturn and the weird and the spots changing in Jupiter or reclassifying Pluto or whatever you want, whatever it is, because the, under, the, the, the subtext is always the same, which is look at Mars as something interesting because you're on a globe. Uh, Jupiter, globe, Saturn, globe. Everything is to remind you you're in space. And if you're in space, then you're on a globe. You're in the sphere. By the way, we never use the word round when we're talking about uh, the world. Uh, it's always sphere or ball or globe because round can be a dinner plate. It can be uh, your dining room table. Technically, mm -hmm. it could be a hubcap, two-dimensional type thing. Sure. But so, yeah, the face on Mars is just another interesting... Do I think it's, do I think it's real? Yeah, maybe. Maybe not, but either way, you're not going to get there. I, I, okay, so you know. what do you, so do you think that it's possible? And I'm just spitballing here. Yeah. If the dome is transparent, or it can't, if you can't see it, can we see through it and not know that we're looking right through it, like we're looking through a window? Uh, I could go either way on that, but for me, it is the the line is: is there space as we know it? No, I, I literally do not think it's any different than a planetarium. Meaning, it, when you look at the, up in the sky at the planetarium, yes, it's wonderful. It's but it's a beautiful. display system. It's yeah, it is the, the sky that we know. When I go outside, the sky that you see is just this fantastically wonderful clock system that predates language. 
That's all it is. It's just a really ornate clock that tells you when things are going to happen. If you, if you hang out long enough and you write things down, you can figure out where thing you know where things happen. And what was that that movie Apocalypto? It's like if you know when eclipse is going to happen, you can freak people out with it and start a whole religion just just off of that. So, um, so do I? Do I think we can see past it? No, I don't. Um, but is am I going to completely deny it? Nope. Because I don't know. Uh, but do I think there's space? No, because I don't think there has to be space. Meaning if we're one world at a time, if we're inside a giant building, could there be other worlds outside of here? Yeah, but it doesn't have to be millions of light years between us. So you're saying that we could be in a completely self-contained reality. Absolutely. Uh, with nothing outside reality. of that. Yeah, well, whatever's yeah, meaning um could we could be in a snow globe sitting next to uh, on a desk of a lab <laughs> next to other snow globes. In different I've always loved so much and and always thought this is just right on point with how I think. If you remember the end of the very first Men in Black movie with the alien yeah. playing the marble rolls the marble and it's yeah. the, it's our entire universe, I I think that's not unlikely at all. Some, yeah, why, some type why of scenario it, that plays out like that. Why would it be? Uh, there was a there was a line. Um, I it could have even been Carl Sagan, where he was saying that the universe is beautiful, but he goes, "It seems like an awful waste of space." Meaning, there's a huge amount of uh, kind of like the atom and micro macro. A huge amount of space that's not doesn't have anything in it, and people. Again, because it's not in our visual spectrum, people don't understand, which is why I have a hard time explaining to people the difference between our atmosphere and a vacuum. Because to our eyes, it seems exactly the same, but it's absolutely not the same. We can't see it. So right. anyways, There's do, things do I all think around us a, that we can't see. Yeah. Do I think we're in a self-contained uh, uh, snow globe building? Yeah, I do. Absolutely. So, Mark, does, is, does religion play a role in this for you? Yeah, it does. Um, I say that with some dread in my voice because I did not know that when I got into this that half of our members would be strong Christians. Well, yeah. And, and the reason was is that when I was doing the clues, as a matter of fact, and I, I was I was raised in an evangelical Christian family, born again. Christian church was not a Sunday thing. It was Saturday. It was Wednesdays. It was youth group. It was Bible camp. All sorts of fun sh stuff. Um, and I fell away from the church when I got into tech, obviously, and you know went off and university. I lived. On, I grew up on an island, right up here, and and very very sheltered. So, but the point was when I started making the original clues, which they did not talk about in the documentary, they avoided the religion thing completely. They were not going to talk about it. church and state. This group was really, really. Well, how is state even involved? I mean, it's well, you know what I mean. Documentary, it's, yeah. Just, they don't. They, they just don't want to go there. Sorry, sorry. Separation between church and media. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Absolutely. It, they, I mean, I heck, we were. Um, well, that's a whole other story. Well, so, I mean, just to interject with my own conspiracy theory, because I think yeah. one of the things that is that is obviously happening in the world today, and and uh, you know, I'm not trying to say Neil deGrasse Tyson is like an evil person or anything like that, or any scientist is evil, but I do think that there's an attack on spirituality that's been going on for you know uh, hundreds of years, maybe yeah. not hundreds. I mean, a long time. I don't. I don't know. I'm 30. Oh, if you, oh, that is that is the biggest reason, by the way, that the flat Earth thing has had a hard time. Which is that the aside from the academics and the economics, it's the spiritual side of things. Which is if you all of a sudden acknowledge to the world that you you know that that you're giving leverage to the five major houses of religion, right? Um, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity. You're giving them all simultaneous leverage against science who's been beating them over the head with textbooks for at least five centuries, right? Building up the, the scientism institution. If you do that, if you let them, if you let them do that, science will never recover. It'll, it'll get ugly in a hurry. It'll be like, okay, so you were really wrong about this big thing. Let's revisit some other stuff like, I don't know, evolution, carbon dating, the Big Bang Theory, dark matter, time and space. You name it. It'll, it'll get ugly. And I think that that's also a part of why 
you know, ancient aliens is mocked in the way it is, even though millions of people love the show and it's been on for what, like 11 or 12 or aliens, I don't know how many seasons religion, now. Yeah. Yeah. They don't, they have to, it seems like, and I'm not trying to be a jerk here. Okay. Giorgio, if you're, if you're out there listening, I'm a huge fan, but it seems like they go out of their way to make him seem ridiculous. Oh, the Giorgio memes are priceless. You know, I mean, even like the way that they present him on the show, it's like they're making the show, but they also kind of, it's almost like a parody of itself sometimes. Yeah, yeah. The way that the people are presented. And I think that that's, it seems a little insidious to me, I gotta say. It is. I mean, part of it's giving the people what they want. I mean, they want him to, to seem a little out there, but also remember, yeah. I don't think they want to give the show too much credibility. That's what I'm saying. Like they, they yeah. have to, they have to, it seems too credible. You yeah, know, let's, well, let's tone it down. Hair. Turn, oh yeah, his, his hair, hair is brilliant. More. Always, <laughs> always. Like, no, his hair is going to be higher. You're too credible. Yeah. The, um, uh, anyway, am I the so, only one who thinks that? <laughs> No, no, you're not. The meme, that's the first thing I look at in every meme. That It's always the same freaking shot of him with those glazed Giorgio, eyes. Please like, do my show if you're listening to this. Please come on the show. <laughs> he, so, I'm sorry. So, the religion thing, the reason why the, the before I even finished the clues, the Christian, the, the entire Christian community were coming at me and saying, you have, you have not addressed God. You're dancing around this. You have to address this. It's mm -hmm. like, okay. So, I did a clue called They Are Hiding God. And that's, that's what I went into. And immediately, the Christian community latched on to flat earth and applied it to the bible and they went through through the fine tooth comb there's a wonderful website out there called testingtheglobe.com uh, by a guy named rob skiba and they all came back and they said yeah it's a flat earth book with the exception of one verse and one verse only as you know the bible is kind of thick a lot of verses in there one verse isaiah 40 22 which says he who sitteth upon the circle of the earth but in the ancient Hebrew, circle is not ball, it's not sphere, it's not globe. It's completely different. If you're a pastor, and I have I've seen this now over the last few years, the pastor gets up, you are scared to death to go to your congregation. That's got to be the toughest one ever and say, oh, yeah, by the way, we're going back to flat. The backlash would be amazing. There are mega churches that are thrown our people out because they, they, because they, they talk about it openly in their, their small group meetings. So... And you can't, they're holding on to Isaiah 40, 22, like it's got veto power over everything. I don't know, like Genesis, uh, the firmament, separating the waters above and the waters below. Um, the, the Werner von Braun on his headstone in the cemetery, it's the year he was born, the year he died, and it says Psalms 19.1. I didn't know it's Psalms 19.1. I had to look it up. You know what it says? Hmm. And the firmament shows his handiwork. It's like, wow, that's kind of cool. It's like, why would you say that, Werner? <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah, Werner? That's, that's a weird one. Uh, Joshua, the story of how Joshua asked God to hold the sun in the sky for an extra day so he could slay more enemies. Well, that's way easier to do if you're just pitting paws on the sky. <laughs> trying to do that with a solar system. Oh, that'd turn into a nightmare. Um, the second coming, where everyone's supposed to see him simultaneously. That doesn't work on a ball. And I got into an argument with a guy on a radio show who called in and says, well, no, anyone's on the other side of the globe will have to see him through a cell phone. It's like, really? That's your argument? Because because Jesus is going to be seen. Really? Second coming, you're going to view it through a cell phone? Really? I mean, I'm sure some people will. But anyway, the point was they all came back, the same thing, your religion question, and they all came back and said, yeah, it's a flat earth book. And immediately the community... They were integrated into to where the, we have conference. Well, we did before last year. We had conferences that were dedicated Christian flat earth conferences, which I couldn't even attend that because I wasn't Christian enough. I was not, you know, burning with the fire. But isn't that cool, though, that you I mean, don't you feel I'm not trying to tell you how to feel. Sorry. But I think it's cool that you've inspired this other group of people who have a shared reality or shared belief with you, but kind of take it in their own direction. You know, I think that's it's, beautiful. Yeah. I mean, no, it's cool. No, don't get, me, don't get me wrong. I just never, it was one of those things I did not look for where uh, in, I, I had a discussion with somebody recently where they said, well, you know, in social media, you should be proud of, of this. I go, yeah, but in social media, you first off, the people who are doing social media are usually much, much younger. And that's what they set out to do. I mean, TikTok was invented and Instagram and Snapchat to cultivate this, this very, you know, under 25 year old market. And I wasn't, didn't want to do this. All I wanted to do was answer some questions. 
and I was asking the, the internet to help me. Now, great that it turned into this weird multi-tentacle thing that has now uh, become way bigger than, than I ever, ever thought it would be. Yeah, and that's awesome, man. I just got to say, I think that is so cool because I I just fucking love weird ideas. And I think that we should proliferate weird ideas because the universe is weird, man. None yeah. of this makes sense. It's no. nuts. This no. is a strange existence that we are participating in. And I, I think that, you know, the great thing about the internet is you can get your weird ideas out there. Yeah, and, 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 and you people. know, and, and some st- a lot of, most of the stuff doesn't resonate, but some stuff does. And uh, the producers are quick to tell you about lightning in a bottle, which is you don't know. You do not. There are so many stories in the media world where, uh, well, hell, there was a great, if you ever follow The Simpsons, the um, season four, I believe, where uh, the I didn't do it kid, where, where Bart became. <laughs> back when The Simpsons was good. Yeah. yeah, back when The Simpsons was good in season four, where he, where I, Krusty was just about ready to push him out of the studio and face first into the gutter, right? He's going, he was, he was going to tell him, it's like, you are abs- you absolutely do not have, he was going to say it, right? What it takes. And as he's pushing him out the door, the, all these photographers is look, it's the I didn't do it kid, right? And they're snap, you know, and, and it's like, and he immediately grabs him back and he says, I own him and all his subsidiary rights. <laughs> and, and that was <laughs> the beginning of the show. Yeah. And, but you don't know. And so in this case, I honestly, people say, oh, you know, you did it for the fame and the money and, and the girls and the drugs and the rock and roll lifestyle. It's like, yeah, okay, first off, that doesn't happen. And second, <laughs> you know what's interesting is that kind of seems like why. Uh, Matt Boyland does it. And I, I got to say, exactly that's kind of what I got to say from watching. I watched some of his videos in, in preparation for this interview. And I, of course, I saw him in the documentary. And that guy seems like I wouldn't invite him to be on this show. He was an I actor. invite you to be on this show because you seem like somebody who's like articulate and, you know, polite and nice and smart. And you, you just want to talk about this thing that you believe in. And I, I love that. He mm-hmm. seems like this was my idea, man. I came up with it and blah. You know, oh, like, oh my just, God! And, and he, I'm, okay, you know what? I'm I'm gonna reel this. Let me take that back a little bit because he seems like he's not well. He isn't. He, well. se- he seems like he's he's off and and you know. Um, he, I I felt bad for him when I, yeah. I, it was really weird be dealing with Matt because every producer wanted to talk to him because he is fascinating on camera. He's an artist. He, his paintings are amazing. Yes, He's, they are. I saw some of his work, and it's incredible. However, as you know, with artists, yeah, uh, it usually comes at a price. Well, genius and, and madness are, are yeah. There's mm, some there's some madness the there, thing. and no yeah. no question. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I'm sorry. Real short. His goal wasn't the rock and roll lifestyle. His goal was the freaking not even David Koresh. It was Jim Jones type of lifestyle. He wanted to buy an island somewhere and populate it with a harem and, you know, plant fruit trees and like give sermons and have him, you know, do, do monologues every night. And he, he is so, I mean, he fled Canada. He was in Hollywood for a while. He, he was a, you know, did a little, little acting and didn't really break out and then just kind of, I don't know, just went back to Canada and fell apart. And, and what was ironic about it was, you know, I did my first interviews because he wouldn't do them. That part of the documentary was absolutely true. He was like, no, no, no press. <laughs> it's like, what you know? and, and so what do you think they did? They asked me, it's like, hey, you want to talk about this? And by the time they came back around to him, we figured out he actually couldn't do interviews. He couldn't hold a conversation. I, he was just so freaking out there he was one he was absolutely convinced that what we're talking on now is being monitored constantly and if there's even a well, flicker yeah i mean he's got that that video in the documentary where he's saying that you're a warner brothers executive you're an yeah. actor and this is all you know well part of that even part of that was an act i've got the emails i saved them from 2015 where uh he there was another guy that wasn't included in the in the movie because he's anti-semitic and Matt wrote me and he says, okay, you are going to be with Eric and I, you, and we're going to call the shots and you're just going to be the workhorse or we're going to discredit you. And I was like, what? I don't even know you guys. It's like, why are you asking me to do things? Like, who the hell are you? Who's Eric? 
and and so yeah and it was was just freaking bizarre so anyway that is bizarre it was a weird trust me when when i say this the producers were they were swimming around for the the television show they were asking you know it's like well is there any drama within the community i go is there drama i go you wouldn't because so many shows you have to build in the drama i mean because it's just boring and flat earth is like no no this thing is way too volatile you've got camps that are well, which is why I mentioned the Scottish Highlands. As you know, there we have clans that are just raging against each other. Which is why, again, the Monty Python it just came to mind when, when I'm so glad they used that clip in the movie. If you remember the, the Life of Brian, where he drops the shoe, and you the such brilliant writing by Monty Python, where everyone's trying to decipher the meaning of the drop shoe, and religions form right there on the sidewalk, and it's like that's us. That is it. That is how. That is us. So anyway. Yeah, I mean that's that's definitely what can happen when you have a powerful new idea that shapes yeah. someone's experience of reality. And, I, and I'll say that from a magician's standpoint, that what I believe magic is, and of course I believe that magic is real. I use magic all the time. It's yeah. just not what people think it is. It's magic is when you create an internal change in yourself when you be, when you change your own beliefs, yeah. and then it, by doing so you change the exterior world. Because when your beliefs change, the way you see and experience reality, you can attest I, to. That. I agree, absolutely agree. Um, all right, Mark. Well, that's uh, about all the time that we've got for today. Um, thank that's you it? so much for being on the show. Yeah, <laughs> it's hey, can, I, can I mention? Can I mention one more thing? Yeah, okay. absolutely. Uh, if anyone wants to look into the virtual reality side of things, there's two uh, big experiments that I highly recommend. Uh, one of us is the obvious double slit experiment. Uh, yes. those, uh, because we have been trying to do that in the computer world. We, we only noticed that in the computer world, this is what we are doing. And, this, and that's also one of the experiments that really points to you know, my belief that we are creating our experience of reality. Yeah. Consciousness interacts with whatever this is, the simulation, the dream, whatever you want to call it, reality, right? Your consciousness is interacting with it. We are a part of the process. Yeah, absolutely. Look at that one. And the other one, which you were, you should look into, I, I almost guarantee you haven't seen it, although you're pretty smart. Maybe you have. Uh, it's called Neuroscience versus Free Will. Have you heard of this? Not, is that a documentary? I haven't seen that one. Uh, no, but it's it's been on several television shows, and science does not like talking about it at all, even though they were the ones that came up with it, which was, uh, I'll describe it really fast. Scientists, of course, hook up electrodes to your head, <laughs> put you in front of a computer, and they say, okay, you're going to pick a number between one and nine or whatever it is, and you know we're going to watch your, ba your brain waves, right? And then they did a secondary part of the experiment was, okay, note the time that you decided to pick the number before you hit it on the keypad. Usually it was within a fraction of a second. It's like, okay, think of number between one and nine. One and nine. Okay, four. Where it got weird was, and maybe you've heard the rumors of this, but it's absolutely true, which is they know, they couldn't tell you, of course, we're, we're not good enough to tell you what number you picked. They could tell when you made the decision to pick that number, eight seconds before you picked the number. Okay. That's very so, interesting. It, well, it's really interesting. So if I say pick a number between one and one and nine, and you say four. Yeah, well, we knew that. We knew when you were going to pick that eight seconds ago. That's impossible. You can't you can't know the number eight seconds. I mean, I I was because nothing's faster than the speed of thought, right? Once this thought is generated, you can't look before I decided to do it. Eight seconds is a long time. And the reason why science hates it, which is why the, the, the it's, there's a wiki entry on it. Look it up if you get a chance. It's called um, Neurosciences versus Free Will, which, because the whole thing screams predestination, which science does not like, which is- I okay, have my maybe own thoughts about that, yeah. But maybe, yeah we're not, maybe we're not living in a virtual reality necessarily. Maybe we're living in a virtual movie. Bear with me for one second. If you want to edit part, this part out, you can, which is- it's something I've, I've always wondered. It's kind of like the, it's not very efficient to live in an open-ended virtual reality. What's way more efficient is that if you make the major decisions ahead of time and then you block the memory before those decisions were made. If you, can, if you get what I mean. So, yes, and, totally and get it. It, so it's kind of like watching, you know, the stupid kids that'll, that'll record video game playthroughs on YouTube. And then the, the lazy kids, they'll just watch the playthrough 
and the, instead of actually playing the game in itself, well, think of the resources you're not using when you're watching that. You're just watching a tiny little film of a guy playing the video game. He's, but the illusion is, is that you're watching the game in real time, but it's not in real time at all. He, the, everything's completely pre-recorded. So anyway, that, that is one of those things for me that absolutely screams, you tie that in with other stuff. I, I, I again, virtual reality for me. I'll tell you what, Mark, um, about a decade ago, <clears throat> I was sitting in a, in a car with my buddy and we were smoking pot. We were in California and we we're just getting high. And, uh, this is again, like I said, I've been interested in occultism since I was a teenager. Um, yeah. but it wasn't. A, a, a spiritual religious experience for me, but I was, I was always agnostic. I always thought like, what, like, I don't know. I'm not going to say I don't believe, or I believe I just don't know. Right. So I'm sitting in the car with my buddy, by the way, and we're just smoking this incredibly good weed. And this is one of the moments that was crystallizing for me. And then I started to realize like, what, what is all this stuff? Right. And I started to ask, you know, we're getting high and I'm just asking questions like, what is time, man? And you know, what is, what is reality? But one of the things that popped into my mind that stuck with me, and again, this is over a decade ago, and it never left my mind, is what if you're not living your life right now? What if you're remembering it? There you go. Yeah, again, the, the difference between the electrochemical difference between an actual event and a strong memory of the event are almost identical. Which is why I feel I I got newfound respect for like Vietnam vets and war vets that suffer We're like Vietnam vets like they swear they hear, hear helicopters. Oh no, they probably are. They hear them literally. They hear them. Yeah. The, yeah, and this is this is. I mean, we could talk for hours about this. Getting into like what is reality because reality is what your brain says it is. You live inside of a holographic simulation of a story that your brain is telling itself. I mean yeah. that that's pretty much how the mechanism works and yep. we're starting to really know that and look at the implications of it yep it's i mean it's beyond fascinating and and when you take it to that level then to me that's immediately when i said well if that's what's going on then all bets are off and you know you could mark from from my point of view i could live on a round earth or a spherical earth and you could live on a flat earth and we could still be having this conversation true because we're decoding the simulation in different, completely different ways, or your your programming is different than my programming. There you you know, and that's not to say that we are machines. I don't believe that. I'm just using these words so people can understand what I'm talking about. Right. You know, I, I, don't, I don't believe that we that we are simulated in that sense. I'm going to believe that we're real and that you're a real person, right? But like, what is real? That's yeah, what. I'm there saying. you go. Yeah. So so said Morpheus. Yeah. Well, thank you. It was it was it was. Uh, an enjoyable conversation. I, I liked it more than most of my interviews. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, awesome. Me too. I mean, this is great, man. Thank you so much for doing it. Um, this show for me, I want this show to go on. I try to do one episode a week, which is hard for me. I have a, I have a young son and I'm, oh. you know, I've got a day job. Um, and I'm new at this. And, and you were inspirational to me in that, you know, I, I do have all these weird ideas. And even though my ideas are like spiritual and it's astrology and tarot, this is very normal stuff for millions of people. Yeah. It's so hard for me to get out there and just say, hey, guess what? This is what I believe. You know, yeah. that's it takes bravery to do that, especially when you know people are going to look at you and laugh. Peer pressure is a powerful thing. It's why I do not read the comments in the chat and the thing. I just stay away from it. Don't feed the trolls. Seriously, I, there's so many thousands and thousands of comments out there. I want to sleep at night like the next person. So, I mean, if I read even half of the stuff that's out there, I'd probably be curled up in a fetal position with a bottle. It's like, yeah, oh, God, sure. make the bad man stop. Yeah, but I mean, you just got to get to that point where you realize that when people need to have the need to, to, to be, you know, a jackass or be mean or, or anything like yeah. that, or just, you know, all those people out there who have a YouTube channel dedicated to proving you wrong, they all owe you a big thank you for making the oh, yeah, YouTube yeah, channel yeah. possible. Oh, no. <laughs> Believe me when I say, when people say, well, what well, these channels, you know, they've got hundreds of thousands of subscribers and they're railing its flat earth. I go, I wish I had, had a thousand more channels just like that. People don't, and I have told them, I go, all you're doing is you're shooting wooden arrows into a bonfire. From a distance, it looks like you're doing something. But all you're doing is adding wood to the fire. You, that's people, a good they one. Don't I'm going to steal it. that. <laughs> that's great. It's true. The the yeah. metrics, you're just helping the metrics. That's all you're And I tell them they don't care. They just keep making videos like, all right. And, and what I notice is that the more I open up and really say, like, look, this is what I believe. You know, it's, I'm not just saying what if. I'm saying I have beliefs. And, 
you know, this is what they are. The more I open up and do that, then the, the more of a, of a positive response I get from people. And of nice. course, there's more haters out there too. But then you really meet. You, in order to meet your your tribe, like your the people who get you, you've also got to encounter your haters. I think that that's just part of the process. Right on. Um, um, so, Mark, there's you... one. Sorry, there was one more thing I want to do if you're open to it. Sure. Um, and have you ever had a tarot reading? I oh no, I haven't. Would you like one? Right now? Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's do it. <clears throat> this is the uh, the Wild Unknown Tarot by Kim Price. Nice. My favorite okay. deck. So there's two ways. Well, there's several ways, but two kind of general ways that this could work. Number one, you could ask a general question. Um, I, I, I think it's a smart to avoid yes or no questions. Uh, tarot is a tool for introspection and for, you know, kind of gives complicated answers. Or I could just kind of do a reading on on you and what's going on with you right now, and you don't have to ask anything. Um, let's just do a reading on me. Okay, that's it's kind good. of a general. I call it that's a oral a reading. One. Yeah. Can I ask you, Mark? What's your um? What's your sign? Taurus. In fact, I Taurus? just I just had my my birthday. It was on April twenty fourth. What happened? Birthday? Getting ordered. Eleven AM in Seattle. Firstborn. Doctors thought there were three sixes on my head, but it turns out there were three nines. <laughs> so I think I'm okay. Okay. So I've got three cards for you here, Mark. And it's actually this is an interesting reading. Uh I won't post this if you don't want me to. I can cut it off. But no, no, you can post it. Because all right, well, um, I'm going to tell you, your three cards are the uh, Three of Cups, Ooh. the Lovers. Was that three three uh, swans? Two. Nice. And oh. the uh, Nine of Wands. So this is a very clear reading to me, so I have to ask you, Mark, are you in like on the verge of, of a relationship with somebody right now? I'm always on the verge of <laughs> a relationship with somebody, but it never seems to happen. Uh, it's weird that you would ask that. I, I, I seem to, I, I call my social life the, 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 the mystery square dance. So I'm going to tell you what I see right here, okay? Because right. I'll, I'll lay out with these three cards. The three of cups is the card of good company. It's the card of like, I'm with my people who I love and they love me. And, and this is like your best friends or, uh, you know, the people who, who you love in life. It's the card of spending time with them. Your That's second card is the lovers. Now this card speaks directly to your relationships most of the time, right? This card is saying that there's somebody that you feel very affectionate towards that's in your life right now and is on your mind right now because what's going to come out of the cards is what's on your mind right now and then the last card you pulled is the nine of wands and the nine of wands signifies that you're almost there you're at the, the you're almost there it's so close you can feel it and you know your what you've been working for is going to come to fruition so how do you feel about that reading awesome <laughs> no honestly that's uh, that's great especially i mean that's the, all three perfect um the first one the the community is for me is is always on my mind uh the second one is is kind of bittersweet because again i'm a, what's what's the old saying always a bridesmaid never a bride i have been close to having i've had some great relationships in my life but i've always been close to having the the ultimate relationship and it just never happens because the the universe treats me like i'm in a square dance where all of a sudden it's like just see do and, and turn your partner and you turn your partner and turn, they're gone <laughs> and that's it and and i have never i've never been married never had kids but the thing is i've never even been close that's the weird part and uh, what this reading is telling me is that you're very close that oh. I mean that this has been a long trek for you, and that this is something you really want and is on your mind. And again, I'm not, you know, I, we can talk if you don't want me to post this. I won't because I know. It's well, no, no, personal. that's fine. No, 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 readings I don't, I don't can get it. very personal very fast. Uh, yeah, that's one of the incredible I mean, things about it. The other thing, as far as getting close to, for me, uh, the the big love of my life was has always been not necessarily an objective truth, but something I've been I've been driving for the last six years with this which is trying to find the answer you know the answer 
to where we are. Why are we here? You know, is it, is it what I think it is? Is it, is it something completely different? Do, you know, do we get the big reveal? And that was in my, sometimes I, I called the hundredth monkey effect, which, you know, is an interesting the concept. Monkey experiment. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which, is which I've been waiting, you know, are we, do we get to that tipping point? But yeah. And that's, I, that's kind of like an experiment that demonstrates that there is a collective consciousness yeah. that there, that there is a psychic connection, you know, between species that I, yeah, I find yeah. that the hundred monkey experiment, if you're, if you're listening out there and uh, you're not aware of it, look it up. It's really cool. Oh yeah. Yeah. And science denies it all day long. It's like, look, I, I hate it when science denies stuff that they were the ones that came up with it. Yeah. As I said, that's a science experiment. Yeah. It's like, Denying. you you did. It's like, no, it's a myth. It's like, really? Cause that sounds exactly like something we would do. You know, that every, every experiment sounds like exactly Silly. something we would do. So no, those, those are good. And I'm again, I'm hope, hoping, you know, hope, I hope for the best. I prepare for the worst. Uh, and you know, always when I, when I go to sleep at night, that's one of those things I, I wish for. Uh, that yeah, we're- I hear you, man. Um, and, and I think that that's, you know, one of the beautiful things about tarot is it'll always pull from a person's energy field. Like right? I, tarot is my explanation of how tarot works is that I'm allowing my spirit guides to communicate with your spirit guides and mm-hmm. to send a message to you through the cards directly from your own spirit guides. And that's what I do. Uh, for a living and cool you know i can tell that the that this is something that's on your mind a lot that this is kind of like you know something that that you are are hoping for and looking for in life and i can relate um and yeah. you're almost there man you're you're uh, you're almost so, there you see that this card the nine of wands is, is a, a stairway oh a long, I didn't know it was a long stairway. stairway with the and at the end of it is the moon very and cool. it signifies, you know, this is something you've been working for and, and, you know, walking up this stairway for a long, long time, kind of thinking, when's this going to happen for me? And it looks to me like it's going to happen for you. Cool. Well, thank you. Yeah, awesome. no problem. Thank, My thank pleasure. You awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mark. It's been really great meeting you. It's been a great conversation. Thanks. Uh, thank you again for being on the show and uh, let's keep in touch. All right. All right. Talk to you later, man. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you for checking out this episode of the Order of Chaos podcast. If you would like to book a private tarot reading with me, you can do so at www.theorderofchaosmagic.com. If you enjoyed the show and would like more, please consider subscribing on Patreon, where you will find my blog, a private Discord community, monthly tarot packages, and more.